Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. And today we're going to be continuing our series on veneer fundamentals and we're going to be discussing the incisal butt veneer. This is a six part series and it's recommended that you watch the series in sequence in order to get the most out of this. We're going to put our attention today towards the incisal butt veneer. But let me go back and review a little bit some of the important guidelines. We really want to make sure that we don't have more than two millimeters of unsupported porcelain. That means that if we have to prepare more than two millimeters, we really ought to be looking at a material like Emacs or contemplating even going to an all ceramic crown. Another important guideline is that we need to include existing restorations. And you may wonder, why is that such an important guideline? If the composite seals well and the veneer seals on the composite, this should work out really nicely. And the reason for this is that there have been numerous studies, and here's one that was done on a 10-year prospective clinical trial, which is an amazing undertaking. This is done by Pumans, and it's in a 2004 publication in the Journal of Adhesive Dentistry. And they looked at 87 maxillary anterior veneers in 25 patients, looking at the patients in a recall span of five years. And of all the failures that they found, fractures of porcelain were a big problem, and marginal defects were the main reason for failure. Marginal defects were especially noted at locations where the veneer ended in an existing composite filling. At such vulnerable locations, severe marginal discoloration and caries recurrence were frequently observed. So we really want to make sure we have the preparations go beyond existing restorations. And then today we're going to prepare a little bit deeper because we're going to make the assumption that the preparation needs to account for the need for a color change. And that means we're going to be preparing slightly deeper than we did in the previous video. But before we go to the preparation, I do want to show you a case that represents one of my failures. And I think we can learn a lot from our failures and make some fundamental changes in our approach, some systematic changes that can enable us to do better. The failure I want to discuss with you today is the tissue issue. And the veneer that was done in this case actually was quite good, but it was the pink that was neglected. So let's take a look at our patient, Michelle. She had two root canals on her anterior teeth on eight and nine on the centrals and that left her with one of the centrals being much darker than the other and the lingual access on both of these teeth was huge and doing full crowns would have left her with basically no remaining tooth structure. So the decision was made to perform two veneers so that the two veneers could be made to match each other and furthermore we wanted to do incisal butts so that we could have full control of the incisal translucency, particularly in the discolored tooth. The veneers were very thin and yet were magically made in such a way to block out the discoloration and yet still provide us with a nice vital looking tooth. Well, the patient was very happy, but I was not happy. Why? Well, of course, I did not manage the midline papilla. She looks worse from a gingival standpoint after treatment than, than she did before. I failed to manage this properly. So let's learn from our mistakes and let's find out how we could have avoided this problem. And it just so happens that a beautiful study was performed by Dr. Dennis Tarnow. And he looked at the osseous crest relative to the contact area and determined how much of the time at what measurement you would find a papilla. And I think that this was a beautiful study that has helped dentistry so much. So let's take a look at his findings. Well, he found that when the space between the osseous crest and the contact area was only four millimeters, the papilla was present 100% of the time. When it was five millimeters, it was present 90% of the time. But when you got up to six and seven millimeters from contact area to osseous crest, it was rare that the papilla would be there. And certainly it was not a predictable situation. So what could I have done differently in this particular case? Well, it's really quite simple. I could have lowered the contact within four millimeters of the bone, 
by changing the preparations and wrapping them around in approximately so that the space could have been filled. And it would have been a very simple solution to this particular problem. So we want to think about our prep design at all times when it comes to papilla management. Because the fact of the matter is that not all patients, healthy patients, have the same distance from their osseous crest to these contact areas. And we can take a measurement with a probe with the patient anesthetized and determine whether they have a normal crest, a high crest, or a low crest. Well, fortunately, 85% of the time patients have a normal crest, and only 3% of the time they have a high crest. But the problem is 13% of our patients have a low crest, and yet they have wonderful gingival health. And this is something that we need to look at very carefully, either through radiographic analysis or through probing to bone with the patient anesthetized. In a low crest patient, they're very susceptible to gingival recession, and these are the cases that we need to be very mindful of. So let's get started with the preparation today, and we're going to start with the Burr kit. Of course, you've already seen this in the first two sessions, but this Burr kit, we're going to use a few different Burrs today. None of these additional Burrs will be utilized. We'll use those in part five and part four, but today we're going to move into the incisal butt veneer and make the preparation a little bit deeper than we did in the facial only prep just because it's a nice variation. Remember that the facial only preparation is really only for slight color changes or shape changes and you can't do any lengthening to the tooth with that preparation. If you want to lengthen the tooth you've got to do at least an incisal butt because that allows us to develop the proper lingual contours. So the preparation today is going to look a lot like the facial veneer prep, but it's going to wrap on to the incisal edge. So let's take a look at the tooth here that we're going to be working on, tooth number eight. And it's a short tooth in the sense that the gingiva is up quite high and the CEJ is located subgingival. And we're going to utilize our preparation guide as we have in the past in order to determine how much we've reduced off the facial in the various areas of the facial, the incisal third, the middle third, and the gingival third. So I thought it would be nice today that we utilized a few different burrs so that you get used to the entire kit's capabilities. And the one we're going to use today for the depth cuts is the LVS1, which is 0.5 millimeters, instead of the 0.3 millimeter reduction we had with the LVS2. We're also going to use the LVS3, which is a little bit wider, a little bit easier to remove a lot of enamel than the LVS4. But we'll use the LVS4 and the 8850014 as well. So the plan is to acquaint you with different ways of preparing veneers for the various situations that you will encounter. We're also going to be utilizing some finishing and polishing discs, and these are the Opti discs made by Kerr, which we showed in the previous video. It has this really nice little mandrel. And we're going to remember that these discs have the cutting side away from where the little notches are in that little grommet there. And we'll do some finishing of the surface with the Jiffy Cup Green. And this is a cup that's made by Ultradent. And then we'll also utilize a Vision Flex Diamond Strip, which will be uh, good for removing undermine enamel in approximately and also creating a very small space between the teeth which will enable us to take an impression and pour up our stone dies in such a way that the technician will easily be able to separate the dies from each other. If we were to measure this particular strip it measures 14 and a half centimeters in length or about six inches. And here we are measuring the tip of the LVS3, and it measures 0.9 millimeters, which is 0.45 if you take half of that. That's a little bit deep for our gingival preparation, knowing how thin the enamel is, so we're not going to use this burr at the gingival. If we look at the maximal width of this burr, it is 1.6 millimeters, and 1.6 millimeters is the same as the shank of the burr, so it's a great measuring device for us. So let's go ahead and start the incisal depth cuts. We're going to go for 1.5 millimeters today. Veneers can have one millimeter reduction, 
all the way up to 2 millimeters, but I thought that we would just do something in between at 1.5 millimeters. And you can use the thickness of the burr as a guide, but you can also use other measurement instruments. We can use the RGS-4 to verify 1.5 millimeters of depth cut in this particular case as well. So let's go ahead and let's remove the portion between the teeth. And I have this in fast mode so that you can get the point of that we're just producing this straight across with a slight inclination towards the lingual. Using the burr tip just to remove those little peaks at either end is pretty easy to do. And you can use the burr also obliquely so that you can remove any scratches or irregularities on that incised ledge. This trick of using burrs in this particular manner is very, very uh, effective. And we're just removing those little peaks on either end. I own a laboratory and one of the things that we notice with some of our doctors is that the lingual margin definition is a little bit irregular on veneer preparations. And I think that if you can make that lingual definition very clean and crisp, it allows the technician a much easier time making a nice veneer. Furthermore, when the veneer is seated, you'll be able to see that it's seating properly. So I like to spend plenty of time making sure that lingual is really straight. So now we've reduced 1.5 millimeters and we're ready to go ahead and place our facial depth cuts. So let's use the LVS-1, which is 0.5 millimeters, and we're going to use it in the same way we did in the previous video. We're going to rotate it so that we can get the middle third, incisal third, and gingival third areas prepared. But we're not going to take this depth cutting burr too far close to the gingival area because we know that that area is very thin in enamel and we're going to want to use a more conservative approach in that particular area by using the tip of that LVS-4, which is very, very small at the end. It only allows us to create a 0.3 millimeter marginal depth. So we're just using the burr across the facial as we've done in, in the previous video to get the depth cut started. And you just move it steadily from mesial to distal. Pretty easy to do. But remember that you need to rotate it so that you follow the facial contour. That little portion between the diamond cylinders is going to stop this burr from going too deep. And you can see the little uh, scuff mark there from the shank of the burr rubbing up against the plastic tooth, indicating that we have in fact reached the full 0.5 millimeters of depth. Remember to rotate it so that this burr is getting the adequate depth in all planes of that facial surface. We're now going to utilize the LVS 3016, which is the thicker of the two veneer margin type prepping burrs. And this one is just very efficient at removing these little enamel bridges between the depth cuts, and it's pretty quick. But we're not going to take this tip and run it down along the gingival because it would be a little bit on the aggressive side. So let's just watch as we prepare that gingival area with the LVS4, which is 0.6 millimeters, and it's going to give us that 0.3 millimeter marginal depth that we're looking for to be ultra conservative. Remember to tip the burr 90 degrees to the facial in order to develop a shoulder that runs up to the incisal edge. After roughening out the preparation, let's go ahead and place the preparation guide back on the patient 
and let's evaluate how close we are to achieving this 0.5 to 0.7 millimeters of clearance that we need to have on a veneer. And I think that if we were to measure this in sizal area, that's an RGS2, that's 0.75 millimeters. You can see that we're right about where we want to be. And that would be an optimal amount of reduction for standard veneer preparation. The middle third, we can also use the RGS2 to measure that and see that yes, that is maybe just slightly less, which is good. And then we can look at the gingival and see that it's even less than the previous section we checked. The RGS1 is 0.4 millimeters, so we're probably about 0 0.55, 0 0.6 millimeters there. We've continued the preparation a little bit to make the continuity between these vertically oriented shoulders and the incisal edge connected. And they connect in these little interesting little channels that sort of wrap around the corner like this. In this particular area on the distal, you can see that the location of the margin is far too much facial. So we're going to extend that more towards the lingual on that side. So that's what we're doing now. We're just making a correction of that distal margin location to bring it closer to the contact area. In some cases you're going to want to bring that margin location much further into the contact area, particularly if you have an existing restoration or if you have a case where you're trying to close a black triangle and the patient has a low crest or maybe they just have a papilla that's blunted and you're trying to hide that unesthetic situation. Now what we're going to do is we're going to smooth the transition by beveling the incisal facial line angle between the facial and the incisal. And after you've established about a one millimeter wide bevel across that junction, what you're going to do then is you're going to change the angulation of the burr slightly so that you bevel the ends of the bevel. So we're going to tip the burr here and we're beveling the bevel. And we're going to do the same thing now on the facial bevel interface. And that's how we gradually make that transition nice and continuous and smooth. When you look at the preparation from the facial, you can see how that angle is rounded. The 885014 is our smoothing burr and I've sped up the video here just so that you can see how this burr can run across the surface obliquely to remove deep scratches. We can make sure that the margin is being placed. And we decided to uh, put this preparation margin equigingival. And just running it over it here with a slow speed, you're able to get a very nice smooth surface with this particular burr in the slow speed handpiece. So now let's take a look at it from the incisal view and see how these transitions are running from the vertical shoulders into the incisal butt. And you can see that all of those transitions should be nice and smooth. And like in the facial veneer, we will have slight undercuts that aren't going to be a problem because the line of draw is not through the long axis of the tooth, but actually is slightly to the facial incisal. Of course, like we did in the previous video, we're going to utilize the OptiDiscs to smooth the surface, the coarse, the medium, and then the fine to remove scratches to provide us with a nice smooth surface, which our technicians will enjoy because the porcelain will be easy to adapt. And then finally, we're going to end up with the Jiffy Green, which is going to finesse these areas and make it as smooth as we possibly can. So now we place the preparation guide back on the veneer, we reevaluate, we assess, we make sure that we're nice and even and we're in good condition here for this particular uh, veneer preparation. So I think at this point uh, the veneer is nearly completed. Let's take a look at it here out of the Typonaut so you can see all the little nuances, how it transitions from the facial to the incisal with this little channel, how the incisal facial is rounded, and the margins are relatively clean 
and defined. And the lingual is straight as can be, so it's going to be very easy to see that our veneer is properly seated, at least from a lingual perspective. The last step is to create a little bit of space between the teeth. Now I have a small diastema on the mesial, so it really wasn't necessary, but we can still use this to remove any loose enamel rods that might be at that interface. So we can just go ahead and run this strip in here just a little bit. But on the distal, it's a pretty tight contact, and I actually had to struggle to get this vision flex strip to get between the teeth. And by doing this now, we have a small, small space that will allow the technician to separate the dies quite easily and not damage the dies. So that's it for today. Please stay tuned for the next video, which will be coming up within a week or so, on the lingual wrap. I want to thank you for your attention. Take care.